Namaste and very good morning to everyone. As usual, we'll start, I thought, with the verse. This is a this is a verse for the Omkara itself. I'll recite it for you and then give you the translation. Omkar Bindu Sanyoktam Nityam Jayanti Yoginaha Kamadam Moksha Janchaeva Omkara This is a verse with which we start our bhajans. Uh, the meaning goes this way. Salutations to him who resides in the spiritual center of the Omkara, on whom the sages constantly meditate. One who grants all desires and liberation to his devotees. Salutations to that Shiva who is represented by the syllable Om, the first syllable of the Sharakshara Mantra. Om Nama Shivaya. Okay, meaning is this. Very glad that uh, we're going to have a talk today by Professor Ramakrishna Odila. Uh, his talk will be on three different schools of duality the Dvaita, qualified non dual. Well, uh, the school that is known as Vishishta Advaita and Advaita, which is one more school. And this will be presented from a Neo Vedantic point of view by considering the latest scientific advances in physics. This talk will also discuss the three paths of Bhakti, Karma, and Jnana Yoga and demonstrate that all the paths are ultimately rooted in self inquiry. Lastly, it will dwell upon the meaning of the self and self-realization. A brief introduction. Professor Ramakrishna Bodila obtained his integrated MS in physics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, in 2007. Later, he graduated with a PhD in physics from Clemson University in 2011. His thesis was focused on understanding defects in low dimensional material using optical spectroscopy. He worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Brody School of Medicine uh, to study nanomedicine and biosensing. He is presently an associate professor of physics at Clemson. His research in of his lab are the interface of physics, biology and nanoscience. Dr. Podila's lab aims to seamlessly integrate the principles of condensed matter physics optical spectroscopy and psychological chemistry to understand physics at the nano scale and nano interfaces. His research has been widely covered by magazines such as the Time Discoverer, BBC, Popular Mechanics, the Hindu, etc. He is mainly known for passive breaking of time reversal symmetry and wireless energy generation. He holds three US patents as on different energy technologies. He is a fellow of the Institute of Advanced Physics his group's research has been supported through funding from NIH, NASA, NSF, and industrial collaborations from Harvard, Sonoko, etc. So, it's a pleasure, sir. Uh, we welcome you, and it's over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I guess you all know me anyway. So, uh, but um, so um, my goal here is to. Uh, provide, like I said, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Indian Philosophy. And what I'm going to try and do is try to provide you the terms. So obviously in the next one and a half hour, we will not be able to cover everything, but my goal is to at least give you terms that you can go back and later Google or you know do your own research on 
And so um, I sent you the glossary that um, you know it's on the Google Drive, so you can look up the terms in glossary. Um, and so uh, let's uh, get started. So I would start with uh, a quote from Avadhuta Gita, that is the observable universe is like water in a mirage. Then to whom shall I go down? And this is the point we'll try to get to. Um, and uh, you know, try to understand what this means. I'd like to start. So, if you look at the map of physics, you have different types of physics: classical physics, relativity, which is Einstein, and you see the chasm of ignorance in between. But but you see all these different things. And when we go out and try to teach physics to say high school students or um, university students, we use a lot of textbooks. Like for example, on the left-hand corner, you see conceptual physics, which doesn't use any calculus at all. It's just completely algebra based. And then you see Resnick and Halliday, which uses a lot of calculus. And then there are Feynman lectures. So you have these different books, but are they talking about something different? And you have these different fields, classical physics, quantum physics, and whatnot. Are they talking about different things? They're all talking about the same thing. And these names and forms are for our understanding. So we divide them into portions, into concepts. So we have, you know, it is easier for us to understand and easier for us to teach. So although you may find, you know, Newton's laws written in one particular way in his books, if you go back to Newton's Principia and read Newton's laws, it wouldn't look anything like what's in these modern textbooks. But yet, yeah, that's what Newton wrote. So, so in a very similar way, I could say Indian philosophy, right? I can throw all these terms at you the classical physics, quantum physics, so on and so forth. But the main underlying thing is we're trying to understand the same thing. And these divisions are there for our convenience. These are not divisions as in that are made that this is my school, I'll follow this school, you should follow that school. It's not in that sense. It, be, it is based on the capacity of the person who is practicing it, capacity of the listener. So if I were to go and teach general relativity in my intro to physics class, you know, people would just fall asleep. Of course, they fall asleep even when I'm teaching Newton's laws. That's a different issue. But, but that's the thing that what we are trying to do is we are trying to power. This is the map of Indian philosophy. And just like the map of physics, all these schools are trying to understand the same thing. There are different names for different aspects. But it's the thing that we're trying to understand. And just like how we have different physics textbooks for different capacities, there are different books that different people have written. For example, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, you know, that's, that's for somebody who wants to just know, you know, how should I live my life in a, you know, a daily basis? I work, you know, I have a family, what should I do? Things like that. And if you want to go deeper, you know, Avadhuta Gita is like a uh, quantum field theory, if I were to draw a parallel. And Tripura Rahasya is like algebra based physics, so that, you know, you don't get into the characters, but you still learn physics. So, uh, so these are the uh, different books that I'm going to draw from. And we're going to go about this in three steps. So step one is Dwaita. Dwaita is duality. Step two is Vishishta Advaita. Vishesha means particular. And so uh, the particulars uh, belong to properties of things. For example, when I say an apple, this apple is red. The redness apple is a property of the apple. So that's a Vishesha. The, the particular property of that thing. So Vishishta is qualified um, Advaita. And the step three is Advaita. I don't like to translate Advaita as non-duality because non-duality contains the term duality. So when you're saying something is not dual, it's only one thing. So I like to translate Advaita as unity rather than as non-duality. So uh, we will begin with um, uh, step one. And I will uh, draw this from um, the movie Matrix, where Mr. Anderson, right? So this is what we're going to do is again, so step one is Mr. Anderson. And step three is Neo. So we're going to go from Mr. Anderson to Neo. And so when Neo visits the Oracle, he, he encounters the spoon boy, and he's bending a spoon. And he tells Neo, don't try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Rather, realize the truth, that there is no spoon then it is not the spoon that is bending, it is you who is bending. Right? So, so that's, that we will use this 
to go through those three steps. And so we'll begin with the first step, duality, there is a spoon. Because you know you understand what's a spoon, you have seen spoon. So that's that's our duality. And most of these things that you're going to see um, in this part in our step one is related to our uh, modern physics. So I will try to make parallels with modern physics. And I'll also try to use some terms from Greek philosophy so that it's easier for you to see you know, an analogous term for uh, the Indian philosophical terms in Greek or um, other philosophies like Spinoza. So um, what I'm going to do is, it's 9, 9.13 now, um, I hope to uh, finish by 10.15. And then, you know, um, if you can write down your questions, we'll, we'll talk about the questions from 10.15 to 10.30 and maybe through the break. And of course, I'm going to be with you guys. And I'm also going to be back in Clemson if you have any very pressing questions, then, then we can we have to have a lot of time to uh, discuss that. So, so we have to put first things first. And the, put, to put the first things first is to begin from ad initio principles. So what does duality mean? As a human being, I look at things around me, I look at the world, look at the stable exists, right? You exist, you change. So that's my first thing. Because that's what I'm trying to study. I'm trying to study the world around me. And so the first step is to recognize that that world exists independent of me. Like, for example, if I were to go out of the room, you don't stop existing. I come back into the room, you're still there. Maybe you have changed places, maybe it's a different time, but you exist and you change. And then the basic foundational principle of all signs we know is the principle of identity or the principle of non-contradiction. This is also the first principle of logic. It's either raining or not raining. It is X or not X. You cannot have both X and not X at the same time in the same way, right? And then principle of causality. If a thing is what it is, it cannot give itself something it doesn't have. For example, a green banana cannot give itself yellow color. Something from outside it must act on it there is some cause, external cause that's acting and it ripens and it becomes yellow, right? That's the change that we see. So principle of causality is something cannot change itself. For any change, there must be a cause. And then the tricky thing comes up as substance and properties. To talk about substance, we first need to ask ourselves, what's a physical thing? What do we mean by a physical thing? We take this for granted. We, we think that we know what a physical thing is and we don't try to put it into words. So, so let's try to uh, think more deeply about what a physical thing is. So a physical thing is something now but can become something else later. So the time that the things exist and things change, that's sort of the underlying definition of a physical thing that it is something now and it can become something else. But all physical things are not substances. Because, for example, if you think about color, now let's do this exercise. Try to think of red by itself. Can you think of red by itself? Don't think of a red thing. Don't think of a red square or a red apple or a red car or red something. Just think of red by itself. You cannot. Because red is a property, it's a physical thing, color is a physical thing, but it does not exist by itself. It exists as an aspect of a substance. So substance is something that exists by itself. And a property is something that exists as a part of a substance. Without the substance, there is no property. Am I making sense so far? Okay. So. And we have to ask ourselves, we, we said change, because our ultimate goal here is to answer this question. What do we mean by exist? What is existence, right? So to understand existence, let's understand change, because everything that we understand is change. For example, you're able to hear me because some sound is falling on your eardrums and there's some physical change that's happening and that's going into your senses, going into your brain, and these are all changes. So first we'll try to understand change and try to get to the root of what we mean by existence and how three different schools of Indian philosophy would, would define um, existence. So 
let's uh, uh, look at the terms act and potency, which you may have uh, heard of uh, Aris from, from Aristotelian philosophy or Plato. So act is what the thing is right now. Potency is what it can become. People also often use this as act as form and potency as matter. Matter is what it can become, form is what it is now. And by change, we mean potency becoming act. I am here now, this is my act. I can be there, that's my potency. I moved over here, change. My potency became actuality, right? So then there are two types of changes that we must distinguish between a substantial change and an accidental change. So you see the bananas there. So the banana ripens from green to yellow, and then it ripens even more, right? So that's a change, but all throughout that, it's still a banana, right? You wouldn't say that the yellow thing is not a banana. It's just a yellow banana. Green banana became yellow banana and the ripened banana, but it's all through banana. But now you take that banana and you eat it. Where is the banana now? It's in you. There's no more banana. You have eaten the banana. Banana has become a part of you. So it underwent a substantial change. So when you are a substantial change, the original substance is not left. It becomes part of another substance. When I eat a banana, the banana has become a part of me. I digest it, the carbs, the proteins, the fat, whatever, the, the minerals, whatever is in it, it's, it's a part of me now, right? So it underwent a substantial change. But the change in color, is not a substantial change. It's still a banana. It's color change. So the properties, um, what um, Aristotle calls as accidents, these are in the Indian philosophy, these are called gunas. Gunas, G-U-N-A-S. And the N is uh, pronounced as na. Uh, let's not get into uh, those things right now. So. So I wrote the principle of non-contradiction or the principle of identity here, just so that you know, it makes a visual impression on you. So a thing cannot be and not be the same thing in the same way at the same time. For example, my shirt cannot both be black completely and be red completely at the same time. It's either completely black or completely red, right? So this is also the principle of logic. You have either X or not X. It cannot be both X and not X at the same time in the same way. And then the principle of causality, right? For every effect, there is a cause and substance and property, which we have seen. Any questions so far? Okay. So then let's uh, try to look at these properties in more detail. We discuss what's a substance and what's a physical thing. So when we look at properties, what is the base property of any physical thing? Base property of any physical thing is that it is extended. What do we mean by extension? That it has one part next to another. That is, for example, if I say I'm a physical thing, I have one part next to another. My hand is here, my legs are there, my head is here, or this pen. This part of the pen is here, next to that, there's another part. And these parts share boundary. Right? As parts is what we call as a physical thing. Any physical thing is extended. Even an electron is extended. Even a proton, a quark, anything, any physical thing is extended. And we're talking about um, a physical substance. So that's an intrinsic thing for any uh, physical substance. And then they have qualities. These qualities can be mass, color, hardness, texture, hot, cold. These are properties because they exist as an aspect of the substance. When we say something is hot, it is that hotness is in that thing. There's no such thing as hotness by itself, right? It's a property. Color by itself, there's no such thing as color by itself. We have a word for color, but, but that color exists as an aspect of substance. So these two qualities are, these two things, quantity and quality, are intrinsic to uh, physical substance. Then there are ex Extrinsic, that is, I can compare one thing to another. I can say Rob is taller than Spencer. I'm comparing, that's a relationship, right? Or it's cooler inside than outside. 
So that's the relationship. So we are comparing two things. And this relationship is at the core of all our modern science because all our measurements are relationships. Because when I say my height is so many meters or so many feet, what I mean to say is I have another physical thing that's sitting somewhere in a museum in Paris, right? Which I call a standard meter. I'm comparing myself to that and I'm saying, oh, I am two times this or one and a half times this. So it's a relationship. When I say my uh, mass is 80 kilograms, there is a uh, iridium platinum cylinder, again, sitting in Paris, that we call as one kilogram. And I say, okay, I'm 80 times that. So when we say mass is 80 kilograms, we are only comparing. The measurement itself doesn't tell you anything about what the properties. It's only coming to things. Mass, when I say is 80 kilograms, it doesn't tell you what mass is. It's a measurement. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Then the next two things are action and reception. This is not action and reaction from Newton's laws, action and reception. For example, I can go push the scale. That is, I can act on the scale. At a table, if it moves or doesn't move, it is able to receive my action, right? So when I act on the table, the table is acting upon me. I am receiving the action of the table, or when I push on the wall, I am acting on the wall. The wall is receiving. The wall is also acting on me, and I'm receiving that. So action and reception, these two things are not the same, right? Because when I'm acting on the table, I'm the actor, table is the receiver. When table is acting, table is the actor, I'm the receiver, right? Um, and there are a lot of constants that show up, for example, like um, Newton's uh, law of universal gravitation. If you write, you know, any high school kid will tell you F is equal to G M and M2 by R squared, two things attract each other. What is this G? Where does this come from? Oh, it's a constant. It just pops up. My teacher told me, so I'll note this number down, use it in the problems and get an A grade. But the G shows up because action and deception are not the same thing. When a body acts on another body versus when it receives action from another body, they're not exactly the same. They, they, they are always proportionate, but they're not exactly the same. That's where it shows up. And, and another one, like if you have two charges, you get KQ and Q2 by R squared. This K is a constant, we say, but that's basically, we sweep things under the rug because we think kids, kids are too dumb to handle it. And they say it's, it's constant, but it comes from action and reception. Then the poet. P-O-E-T, place, there's a place, you're sitting in a place. Orientation, right, up, down, that, that way, this way. Environment, right, fish is in water, right, whatever is surrounding. Last one is time. This is very, very important. What do we mean by time? Time is the duration of change. And change is potency becoming actuality. So I'm here now, that's my actuality. And I can go there, that's my potency. So if I actually move here, there's a duration in which my act, my potency has become the actuality. And the duration of that change is what we call as time. So time is not something that's going in the background. If you have only one thing, would it have time? Because time has to do with change. If you have only one thing and nothing else, just one thing, what would you mean by change? Because change, when I say I changed, I'm able to see I'm here now, I could be there, and I'm going here and I'm saying I'm not there. How am I saying that? Okay, when I'm here, that table is another thing that's farther. When I'm coming here, the table is closer. So I'm comparing myself to things that are placed around me. And by that, I'm saying I changed. Imagine you're standing in this vast space where there is no thing that can tell you where you are, like there are no tables, no chairs. Remove all the qualities from everything, right? How would you know whether you are here or you are there, right? So, so the change is an extrinsic thing. So time is an extrinsic thing. We often think of time as a background that it's flowing by itself and we're somehow going in the background. So time is not like a flow that, that's going in, um, in the background. So, so then um, 
we'll talk about knowledge. What do we mean by knowledge? For example, um, you see a dog and say, I know what a dog is. What do you mean by that? What we mean is that I have seen a particular dog and then I have abstracted from my sense knowledge by seeing, by, by the image of the dog, I've abstracted what a dog is. I don't have to see all the dogs in this universe. I just need to see one dog and I know dogness. So you show me another dog, I can say, oh, that's, that's not a dog. I, I may not know what breed it is or what, what it may be, but, but I know it's a dog. Or you, you watch a sci-fi movie, you see something and you may have never seen anything like that, but you're sure you'll recognize that it is an animal because you have the general or the universal idea of what an animal is because you have seen particular animals and then you derive this general knowledge. So the three kinds of knowledge, sensorial, all our knowledge comes from our senses, but all our knowledge is not sensorial because without our senses, right? We cannot get any knowledge. I see you, I touch this, I feel it, right? I get sensorial knowledge, but then I take that in and I elude upon it, I dwell upon it, I consider it, and then I draw the generalities. So the ability to draw generalities or universalities from a particular thing is intellect. And then there is intuitive knowledge. This intuitive knowledge is without words, that you know it. So Einstein once said, I very rarely think in words. There's a thought that comes and then later I may try to express it in words. So something like general relativity that becomes an equation way later, it comes intuitively and then it may be expressed in words and then um, uh, you know, uh, later into something else. But this infusion is not, I know Rob is not thinking well about me. That's not, that's not the infusion that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the mental games. I'm talking about infusion. Anything you use language for is not infusion. Intuition is without language, you, you have it, right? And so we can define knowledge as, as the unity of the more with the common. And here is the trick that when a banana changes from green to yellow, you have yellow banana. You don't have greenness anymore. It's lost, right? But let's say there is a child who never saw a dog, sees the dog for the first time, and then learns of dogness. Did the child vanish? Did the idea of I vanish? No, I'm still there. So this knowledge is a change, but it's not a substantial change. When physical things change, they acquire another form and lose the form they had before. When I'm here, I'm here. When I'm there, I'm not here anymore. But the I-ness is not lost, right? I'm still me. So knowledge is the unity of the knower with the known without losing the aspect of what one is. And then we'll distinguish between idea and image. This is again, another thing we must make in science that what's an idea? An idea is that by which we know things. For example, tree. When I say tree, that gives you an idea of what a tree is. In your head, you have the idea of tree. By that, you know a real tree. If there is no corresponding real object to that, it's meaningless, right? So this word tree is something, a tool by which you actually know a tree. So people like Descartes miss this completely and say, I think, therefore I am, because they think ideas are all the things that are there. But it's not just the idea that is there, there's actual reality corresponding to the idea. This idea has a unity with something that's actually existing. There is a tree, therefore there's the idea of tree, the idea of tree is united with a physical tree. An image. So an idea and an image are very different. For example, if you have um, a child thinking about a unicorn eating chocolate ice cream on top of a golden mountain, the child is basically putting several images the child has in his or her mind together. Those are not ideas, those are images. So when we say we have an idea, we mean to say we understand the essence of that thing. 
when we say we know a tree, we mean to say we have an idea of a tree. By that we mean we know the being of a tree or we know the essence of a tree. The essence of a tree is it's a single substance. It's a single living thing that is there. And I'm able to acquire that idea and not change substantially, still retain my nature, I, and, and know the tree. So idea is knowing the essence of something. Image is just an image, like a photograph. So we have to distinguish between images and ideas. And then real being and being of reason. So we often say, or, or um, you know, nothing. What is it? Oh, it's nothing. What is nothingness? Does nothingness exist? We know some things. No, I know something. I know a table. I know a chair. I know you. That's something. And so if you ask me, where's the table? I can point to the table and say, oh, that's the table. Because there is a physical thing corresponding to that idea. But nothingness, I know something. Therefore, I can imagine use observe the word imagine is related to the word image where i can imagine something not being there and therefore i say nothing but if i were to ask show me this nothingness you cannot because it's a being of reason because we know some things we're able to abstract and say something right so where are you right now which country are you Which country? India. What is India? Is it a real being or a being of reason? What South Carolina? Is it a real being or a reason? What's Florida? Real being or being of reason? What's a Catholic? Real being, being of reason. What's a Hindu? Real being or being of reason? Right? And we often, um, you know, these, these things actually lead to a lot of difficulties because we get immersed in these beings of reason. Oh, I'm an Indian, I'm a Hindu, I, I'm a physicist, I'm that, I'm this. And then, uh, and then I want to be special. And then I say, oh, okay, India is better than US or US is better than India and all these things. But, but these things are just beings of reason on earth. Let's say you're an alien coming from somewhere. You don't see India anywhere. There's no India. It's just, we draw up something on the map and go, oh, this is India. Or oh, this is South Carolina, right? So then let's get to the core of it. What is the modern scientific method? Can anybody tell me what is the modern scientific method? What's modern about it? Right, writing it down. Very good. So Plato is the one who said, it's good in theory, what about experiment? And Plato wouldn't be considered modern, right? Plato existed way before modern times, you would say. So hypothesis, experimentation, validation is not really the modern scientific method that has existed all the while. So what's the modern scientific method? Modern scientific method is to make use of symbols to represent this. It's not that people didn't understand locomotion before Newton and Newton came along and somehow we magically understood locomotion. Newton took that general understanding and then coded it in symbols. I say, is equal to dt by dt it's uh, and using symbols mathematics to express our general understanding in that so mathematics is at the core of our modern scientific method so we're not just writing it down in english it's way more than english or any other language right so we are codifying it in mathematics and what is the need to do that because then I can predict now, oh, okay, Newton says f is equal to dt by dt. And then, so if I throw this ball, I should be able to calculate where it should fall. So let me do that. And then, oh, it should fall there. Then I can verify and say, oh, it's valid, right? So modern scientific method basically brings forth a huge leap in our understanding by using mathematics. And what is this math? We saw, up there, the base property of any physical thing is having extension, having one part next to another, having multiple parts. 
the study of the base property of physical things is math. Math is not what you do in math class. Math is the study of the basic property quantity. So therefore, naturally, you can do it in two ways. One, you can just look at the shape of things. You say this is circular, this is spherical, this is cylindrical. The shape is one aspect of math. But I can also count the number of parts. I can say I have five fingers, five more fingers. So I'm counting the number of parts, not the shape. So, so the two major things that you can see then is one is shape, one of the is numbers. The shape is what we call as geometry. And this numbers is what we call as arithmetic. And the important thing connected these two things using something called an so x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Your symbols. What does that mean? X for a circle. Now I'm no more drawing shapes. I am in fact writing them in symbols. Right? That's the modern bridge. That's the part. That's the modern part of the scientific method. We understood shapes. We have Pythagoras theorem, um, and, and because I'm in India, I should say uh, some other person invented it. But but I am not very interested in who invented it, who is the first, who is the second. You know, whether Greeks did it first, Indians did it first. It doesn't matter because all those people are human beings, and and I'm just great, feeling great to be a human being, not feeling great to be an Indian or an American or uh, you know somebody like that, but. It's just human to see these particular things and abstract them into general things. So we have Pythagoras theorem that is hypotenuse. You know, you can get the hypotenuse from adjacent and opposite sides, but now we can actually express it in, you know, I can say A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared and draw a right angle triangle. Now I don't have to triangle it, I just write it as an equation. So we have algebraified geometry. That's the modern aspect of um, uh, science. So now I'm getting to, you may be thinking, what's duality in all this? The duality in all this is see how all this is dependent on the external thing. We have actually not talked about the eye part. We are only looking at, oh, there's a table outside me, there's this outside me, there's a ball. I'm looking at all this and I'm coming up with these terms, these general ideas, the universal ideas and expressing them in some fashion so we can communicate with each other. So then let's look at impetus and energy. Impetus is something you would hear in a physics class as momentum. This impetus is a property of an object. If I have an object, a physical substance, it has a property called impetus. So once I activate this property, it moves along a linear direction, unless it is stopped. That's from Newton's laws. So this impetus is a property and the measure of that impetus is what we call as momentum. And what is energy? Energy is the transfer of this impetus. So for example, I push a ball, right? The ball is moving. When the ball is moving, it's carrying its momentum with it. It's carrying its impetus with it, unless it is stopped, right? And that's the energy. Energy is activity, but energy is also a property of, of the body. And so then, Let's get to causality and try to, we'll use um, Aristotelian causes. So there are four types of causes, material, formal, efficient, and final. So a nice example for this is a house. We need some materials to build a house, right? We need a shape. I want to build this house like this, two floors. Right, um, and then you need an addition. You need someone to build it. And the final cost—the final cost for the house. I wanted the house. I decided to build the house. I'm the final cost for the house. Right. So Aristotle has four different causes, but in Indian philosophy, you have two causes. One is nimitta, and another is animitta. Nimitta is same as the efficient cause. Animitta is anything that's not efficient cause. So you can also say it as proximate and not proximate. 
So if I push something, the proximate cause is the force that was applied on. So that, that's the, the impetus that I have given is the cause, the proximate or the efficient cause of its locomotion. But what is the final cause? I wanted to push it, so I pushed it. Right. So when we ask, what is the cause of this thing? We also have to be aware, which cause are we referring to? Are we referring to material, formal, efficient, final? Because this is going to come back to bite us because always we say, oh, God created the universe. That's what you're supposed to go Did, does, Can God have a final cause? Does God, you know, God wants me to suffer because I should learn something? And does God have such a final cause in him or her or whatever the case? Right. So as human beings, that's what our science has always been, trying to look at this causality. So Newton came up and then with calculus, we started getting some things. And then there was Maxwell, then there was Einstein, Schrodinger, blah, blah, blah. So we you know all these equations, which we understand or do not understand, but it's all trying to express our general understanding into some equations. Now, if you ask a nihilist, what are you? Are you just a bunch of atoms or are you a human being? Are you 10 to the power 23 atoms or, or a human being? Then the answer you would hear is, okay, let's look at an atom. There is a proton in the center in a hydrogen atom and there is an electron out there. In between, there is nothingness. What's this nothingness? Does it exist? We just saw nothingness is a being of reason. So we are saying our atoms are beings of reason. It's not nothingness. Newton made this huge mistake that is, Newton thought there is earth, there is sun, there's moon, nothing else in between, right? He thought it was nothingness and nobody bothered about it until Einstein came because Einstein didn't go to formal high school education, right? So he had time to think about it and he said, oh, that cannot be nothingness. That doesn't make sense. There must be something. And that's what we call as space. Space is not nothing. Space is a physical thing. But it's not like the other physical things that you see, because the other physical things that you see in your daily life that you can, you feel the physicality of it are often related to energy or mass. You think about a physical thing as something that has mass. But we saw the base property of a physical thing is not mass. The base property of a physical thing is to be extended, to have one part next to another. So space is non-massive, but it is very real. It's not nothingness. So when we say, oh, I throw a ball up, the ball falls down due to gravitation. Where was this gravitation? Where was it hiding? The ball and the earth are not touching each other. When I touch a table and push on it, you can imagine there's contact. So I'm applying a force through this contact but when there, there is ball up in the air, there's no contact between earth and the ball. So how is earth able to attract it back? This gravitation that we're calling is a property of a physical thing called space. And that's what we mean when we say, oh, space bends around a planet, space bends around a star. These are properties of space. Light is a property of space because light is essentially made up of electromagnetic fields that are varying. Where are these electromagnetic fields? They are in space. And the space is non-massive. And this space is what is called as akasha in Indian philosophy. Kash means that which exists. Akasha is that which exists. And it's not massive. So when we think about the universe, we often think about Big Bang. What is Big Bang? Big Bang is essentially solutions to one set of solutions to Einstein's field equations. Uh, and uh, incidentally, it, uh, they, they, were, they, they were derived by Lamarckre, who, who, who is a Catholic person, right? Who is a Catholic priest. And then it is said that um, Einstein got up in class when Lamarckre presented these equations. They were published in some English journal, but, but anyway, they came about. And then what does this Big Bang say? Oh, the universe is expanding. You ask any physicist next time you see them, what is it expanding into? Because expansion, I understand it is a blow a balloon up. The balloon is expanding, but there is space around me. So it's expanding into the space. What is this universe expanding into? If there is something else that is expanding into, what is that something else? Is that not the universe? 
Are we saying, oh, we're drawing a line and saying, oh, this is the universe, that's not the universe because, hey, don't look at it, you know, and it's expanding. There you go, I pulled a rabbit out of the hat. The universe is expanding. What do we actually mean by that? And then we try to interpolate that back. Expansion is extrapolation, and then interpolation is going backwards. We say, okay, we are here. Today is the 17th and it's 9.45 and drama is going on, talking about some stuff. But before this, we had breakfast. Before that, we had yoga. Last night, I slept um, and, and so on and so forth. Keep going back, keep going back, keep going back. That's a big bang theory, right? So keep going back and then what do you see? You say, oh, there was nothing. And then something came out of it. Nothing is non-existence. Something is existence. So how can existence come out of non-existence? Just doesn't make any sense. Does it? What is this existence? What do we mean by the universe exists? What is this Big Bang theory trying to tell us? Because somewhere along the modern line, once Newton started using math, we limited philosophy to an armchair discipline. I have a doctor of philosophy in physics, but I'll surely tell you all my colleagues, most of them are not trained in philosophy. We actually don't even have to take any course in philosophy ever to become a PhD in any field of science. Because your core courses would be classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, E and then no, no, no philosophy. Philosophy is not required. But at the end, you get a doctor of philosophy. That's your degree. My degree is not in physics. My degree is a doctor of philosophy. Right? So we got so embedded into the numbers that we forgot this math, we, for, we forgot what is, what is leading to this math. And we just talk in math. Oh, this equation tells me that it should extrapolate to nothingness. And then it bothers me. But how can something cannot, can come out of nothingness? What is this universe expanding into? What do we mean by existence? Oh, I've been saying physical things. Oh, there are this one part next to another. Now, let me ask you a question that uh, most of you know that when I say I see you, light from you is traveling from there, coming to my eyes, goes into my brain, whatever happens, and then I recognize you are there. And I see Spencer. Spencer is sitting behind Rob. Rob is closer to me than Spencer. So light from Rob is reaching me first. Light from Spencer is reaching me later. So if I have multiple parts, say this pen, am I seeing all these parts at the same time? Or is it your brain that somehow there's some mechanism without getting into much of neurophysiology, there's some mechanism that, that gives you a coherent picture. Oh, this is all at this time, at snapshot, because these things, these distances are so tiny that almost light travels almost at the same time to your eyes that you're unable to perceive the difference. Do this with sound and see that although two people say something at the same time, for example, if Rob and Spencer say hello at the same time, I will hear Rob's hello first and Spencer's hello later, right? Because speed of sound is lower. So what do we mean by existence? So I say this table exists, but I'm not able to see all the parts of this table at the same time. Are you following? Right, so, so that's where we get stuck with the part one, right? There is a spoon, we have seen the spoon is a physical thing, physical substance, a spoon I mean the universe, and this has parts. You can't say all these parts at the same time. So now I'm asking the question, what is this existence? What is this spoon? So this is, so far what we have seen is duality. And just like modern math and modern thing, a lot of texts like Madhva texts have described this in great detail. And they also describe this and space and that one massive and it should bend and it should warp. All these things are described. Of course, they don't have the mathematical precision of Einstein. So we could, we could uh, detect uh, the gravitational waves like 100 years after Einstein died. But that's after putting forth a humongous effort. These things to test them, I cannot test them. Oh, okay, I want to test this. So let me go out. Uh, you know, Test it out. It's not like that. I need billions and millions of dollars to construct this LIGO, and I need uh, thousands of scientists to build CERN, and it's a huge matter. And then you know, there's, there's politics and all this. So, so validation is not as easy as theory, right? Because it it it, it involves 
a lot more resources. So this is where the duality school stops. It stops at Akasha. What is this Akasha? And then it asks the question that, okay, something has come into existence means something must go out of existence. I am born means I will die. Because you see these things, you see these changes around. There was a tree the other day and after a few years, that tree is no more there, right? So you see that whatever came into existence has gone out of existence. Then you start to think about the universe. Now, okay, there is a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way, right? And even the black hole is going to go away because of Hawking radiation, right? So one particle is going to fall into the black hole, another is going to come out, blah, 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 after a few mathematical equations, yeah, black hole will eventually evaporate. Let's say all the things in the universe evaporate. What's going to be left? Nothing doesn't exist. It's not nothingness. It is something. It's an equilibrium state, right? So this is where the duality stops, and then we come to which is stopped by that non-qualified non-duality. I can still the, the Advaita part here. I'm still translating it as non-duality because it has still quality which is. So now we're saying there is no spoon. We started with there is a spoon. Now we're going to say there is no spoon. Let's say what, what we mean by there is no spoon. We have to be very, very, be very careful here. When we say there is no spoon, we are not denying reality. We are not denying that the table doesn't exist. We are only asking, what do we mean by the table? Table is a word. You look at the ocean and you say there are waves on the ocean. Now I ask you, bring me a wave. Don't bring me the ocean, bring me a wave. Can you separate the wave from the ocean? You cannot. A wave is wave insofar as it is motion of water molecules going up and down in the ocean. Wave is a word we made up to identify, oh, those, those disturbances in something are wave. Just like how I cannot imagine color by itself. Color exists only as an aspect of something wave exists as an act of ocean there is no wave as such pendently by itself wave is a disturbance in something light is a wave we would say oh light wave doesn't require anything no light wave travels in space it's just that the space is non-mechanical so when we say light doesn't require a medium what we actually mean is light does not require a mechanical medium because sound requires a mechanical medium because the atoms have to move the pressure changes you have compression refraction all those things going on and that's how you hear the sound because you require something massive to move around and that's sound but light is traveling in space and it's non-massive so here by by saying there's no spoon what we mean to say is there's no wave meaning wave exists as a concept it's not a real thing it's a being of reason and that's what we're uh, trying to get at. And to do this, um, we have to define infinity. Look at the question. How do I define infinity? Definition. What is definition? How do I define infinity? What is infinity? So usually we think about infinity as, okay, I have um, a stick that's this long. I could have a stick that's longer. I could have a stick that's longer than the longer one. And a longer stick and longer stick and keeps continuing and we say, oh, that's infinity. But that's not infinity because, you know, it has to end somewhere, right? There must be some end. If it ends, it's not infinity, right? Then we can say, okay, I have this really long distance, which I'm going to call infinity. Then let's say I will measure this in foot lengths and say this is so many foot lengths. Then if I measure this in inches instead, the infinity of the inches is more than the infinity of foot lengths, although it's the same thing that you're measuring. Right? So infinity, to understand infinity, you have to understand non-physicality, immateriality. Space, Akasha, all the things that we see around us, these are physical things. Your intellect, however, is not physical. Let's say justice. 
for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Where is this liberty? How much does it weigh? How tall is it? How wide is it? What shirts does it wear? Does it like American cuisine? What is the beingness of this liberty? What is this happiness? Is it a physical thing? Oh, it's a concept. What's a concept? How can you have concepts? Because your intellect is non-physical. By non-physical, what we mean is when I acquire the idea of a dog, I don't change. I am still me. Right? So I don't undergo substantial change. A physical thing undergoes substantial changes. I don't undergo substantial changes. I was a kid, I was a man, I'm now a man, but I'm still me. Right? So this non-physicality doesn't have parts. Your idea of justice has no parts to it. Your idea of liberty has no parts to it. Your idea of love has no parts to it. So when you have no parts, it's not something physical. And when you have no parts, you cannot divide it. How do you divide something that has no parts? It's indivisible. So by infinity, we mean something that's single, something that's whole, something that's indivisible, something that exists not by itself, something that exists of itself. It is the only thing. There are no two infinities. If you have two infinities, I can compare this infinity with that infinity and say, oh, this infinity is bigger than that infinity, then that's not infinity. There's only one infinity. It cannot be two infinities. Right? Freedom. What do we mean freedom? Will. Right? So let's see. Natan, raise raise your hand. Okay. Did you do that out of your free will? Did you raise your hand out of your free will? Yeah, I asked you to, but you still had a choice, do you think, to raise or not raise? Okay. But why did you raise your right hand and not left hand? Why are you right-handed? What is natural? <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to get at is, I'm not trying to hold you to death here, but what I'm trying to get at here is that there's a cause. Nothing is a causal. Everything happens from a cause. He raised his right hand because there's a cause for it. He said it's natural, but what he means to say is, oh, from his childhood, he has been raising right hand, he's right-handed, so he raised his right hand naturally, right? But there's a cause. Right? So, where is this choice? Who is doing this thing? Let's say I have a stone. I'll drop it. It's falling down. Let's say the stone has consciousness. The stone would feel I'm moving out of my own free will. But it's dropping because there's a cause and an effect and it follows. It's actually not doing anything. Because everything that you have done till now that you think you have done follows right from your birth. So then the next question, do you know you were born? Do you have the proper knowledge of your birth? Meaning, proper knowledge meaning first-hand knowledge. Do you know where you're born? Do you have the proper experience of being born from your mother's womb? I don't. My mom told me, oh, you were born on this day, this time, okay, this is it, this is your birthday. You can ask for a gift every year. And, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, but, but I don't have the first hand experience. Or has no first hand experience of her birth. My grandmother probably told my mother, this is your birthday, you can ask for a gift, blah, 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 and it comes down from generations. Right? So what do we mean by this free will? What do we mean by freedom. Do we have freedom? Because if everything is cause and effect, where do you create this cause from? Let's say I want to do something. I am going to push this. I'm making a choice. You are sort of getting into a place where you're saying there is no cause before and I'm creating a cause. You're not creating anything. It's just the cause that was before just follows. So to understand this better, let's talk about necessary and contingent. What do we mean by necessity? 
I push something. When I say I push something, a necessary effect follows. I cannot stop that. I can apply another force of the thing from moving, but that's another force. But whatever effect, whatever force I have applied, it has been received by the table. The table may or may not move, but the effect naturally follows. If there is a cause, there is a there's an effect. Effect necessarily follows from the cause. You cannot have just the cause and no effect. What is contingent? Let's say you, you go back to Clemson, it's October and there are beautiful fall colors. You look at uh, a tree in your yard, pick any leaf that you like and ask yourself the question, where is this leaf going to fall when it falls? Let's say the tree is here, we pick one leaf and we're asking the question, where is this leaf going to fall when it falls? Will it have a cause for falling? Yes, there's something physiological going on in the tree, something from the environment, and then it's going to fall down. But we cannot exactly tell, oh, the leaf is going to fall down right here. Why? Because, oh, it depends upon how the wind is at that moment, or it depends, you know, what's happening around. And I don't know what's going to be happening at that particular point of time when the leaf is actually going to fall. So I'm ignorant of those causes. Therefore, I cannot exactly tell where it's going to fall. But I can tell it's going to fall because I know the gravitation is going to fall. Yeah, that, that much I can tell. I can tell some things, but I cannot tell exactly where it's going to land because I'm ignorant. That is contingency. I don't know the secondary causes. I know that if there is a force, it should move in that direction. And I know wind can apply a force and things like that. So that brings us to the concept that Josh's favorite and my favorite discussion in the cars and the car rides to Bangalore, what is randomness? You take a coin, you toss a coin, is it going to be heads or tails? Would that be completely be determined or is it random? coin toss, I, I apply a certain force on the coin. I know the coin mass, I know the coin shape, I know the coin thickness. So if you have done enough rotational mechanics, you can say, okay, this is the angular momentum. This is the force. So it's going to go up like that. This is the a drag. This is going to turn like this, come back down, heads. There's nothing non-deterministic about a coin toss. But every time you flip it, Sometimes it's set, sometimes it's staged because the environmental causes are different. It's not exactly the same way drag every time you toss. It's exactly, you're not going to catch it at exactly the same place. So you can remove all these variables and see that actually you can make a machine that would flip every time to heads, right? But this coin toss is perfectly, completely determined. It's just that we don't know all the causes. I don't exactly know what the A drag is. And therefore, I call it random, pseudo random. And this leads to quantum mechanics. What is quantum mechanics? We often talk about wave particle duality. We say electron is both wave and a particle. This is like pulling the rug under your feet. You're standing on the principle of causality for deriving your entire science, which says that you either have X or not X. And then you say, oh, you know what? It's both X and not X. It's both a wave and a particle. How can it be both a wave and a particle? This is because we confuse. Confusion is fusing two different ideas in our mind and not having the clarity. The wave part is in the space around it. Because in the space around it, we don't exactly know what the electric magnetic gravitational fields are in the space around it. So if I have an electron, it's so tiny, it's so sensitive to all these minimal changes. I'm not sensitive to all those changes because they're much much more less intense compared to my body. So I, I can say I have a definite position, I'm standing here. But if I have an electron, I don't know all these things. I'm ignorant of all the causes. When I toss a coin, I'm ignorant of all the causes. I'm ignorant of all the conditions that are in space and I cannot exactly prescribe them. Therefore, I cannot exactly specify where an electron is located. And therefore, I try to look at it as an ensemble. That is, electron could be here, electron could be there, electron could be there but I can still derive some average knowledge from it. That, oh, if the electron is somewhere in this room and it is thrown, it's going to go somewhere here. If 
but I can still get average knowledge. So quantum mechanics comes from the fact that we are ignorant of secondary causes, right? So now that brings us to the big question from free will, fate and destiny. Are you actually doing anything? Are you actually choosing to do anything? Do you actually have free will? Right? So then I want to, to address this question. I want to go back to why we call this qualified non-duality. Um, so we said there is infinity. So when all the things in this universe evaporate, there's not going to be nothingness, there's going to be something. And that something is indivisible. It's infinite because I cannot distinguish one part from another. Physicality comes when I can distinguish one part from another. And how can you distinguish based on the properties that we saw? The relation, action, reception, place, orientation, environment, time. You say this thing is here, the place, that thing is there. Distinguish. But if all the parts in the universe are exactly with the same activity and exactly the same thing, how can you say that's it, that is here and this is there? They don't have anything that distinguishes one part from another. Right? So that's what is Vishishta Advaita calls as the single substance of, that is infinite. And because this is infinite, it has infinite attributes. This is also same as Spinoza's philosophy. You read Spinoza's of Spinoza's ethics begins with this definition. There's only one substance that exists of itself and this substance being infinite, it necessarily follows that it has infinite attributes. Observe the word necessarily, because if it's infinite, then I cannot say it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that. Because if it doesn't have this, where is that thing? If let's say there's infinity and I say, oh, infinity does not have red color. Uh, then, then I would say, where is this red color? Because you have to say, oh, the red color is there and that red color is not in this. So where is this red color? Oh, it's outside the infinity. There's nothing outside the infinity. Infinity is all there is, right? So Vishishta Advaita now tries to talk about infinite attributes and Spinoza calls this, Spinoza only focuses on the first two attributes, but um, the uh, Vishishta Advaita tries to focus on three attributes, Sat, Chit, and Ananda. Sat, Sat means extension, existence, what, what, what is. So this room is Satya, right? This room is called Satya. Your internet is Satya. Satya is what exists. So the other day I asked a question to one of the speakers here, what is truth? The answer is in the question. Truth is what is. What is truth? Truth, what is? What is, is truth. And uh, Aquinas defines it a little more beautifully. Truth is the confirmation of mind to reality, right? So, um, so coming back to here, so sat and chit means chit is whatever this infinite substance, that single substance is, it's a thinking thing. It is an extended thing. And this thought and extension are not separate from each other. These are parallel attributes. The texture of a banana and the color of a banana are not separate qualities. They are parallel qualities of a banana. If it's green, you know that it's going to be hard, it's going to be raw. If it's yellow, you can say maybe it's going to be softer. But these are parallel qualities. So such shit, extension and thought are two attributes of this infinity. We'll come to what Ananda is later. But God is a thinking thing. So God has ideas. By God, here we mean that infinity, that infinite substance. This is not a personal God. This is not somebody who has a form. There is no spoon, remember? There's no form here because it's infinity. Form exists when I can distinguish one part from another. If there is no distinction between two parts, there is no form. So that's what Vishishta Advaita is trying to say that you have Sat and Chit, and these are together. So when we say God is a thinking thing and God knows himself, God has an idea of himself. And God's idea is necessarily an act. That is, if God has an idea of a tree, the tree exists. God doesn't have to draw a plan, build a tree. There is no time. Why there is no time? Because we saw time is duration of change. And what is change? Acting. 
What is potency? Something that exists not as actuality, but as potentiality. So what is potentiality for this infinity? There's no potentiality for this infinity, it's pure I. Therefore, it has no change. Eternity is not today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, seeing in time, just like how we saw infinity is not a longer stick that extends all the way to some place. Eternity is not year by year, you know, 2022, 20, 23, 24. It's not that. Eternity is no change, changeless, beyond change. So then whatever is God's idea is act, pure act. Pure, God is pure act. God is pure idea. It's a thinking thing. And therefore, if it thinks, it necessarily exists. So then is there anything that God does not know? Because if you say, oh, there is this thing, God does not know what M is going to do tomorrow, let's say. And again, this is not a personal God. Don't, don't confuse yourself with personal God. We're talking about the infinity. That means there is something that's not there in that infinity. That means it's not infinity anymore, right? So whatever is and whatever is going to be there is there in this infinity exactly at a snapshot. When we have externality, when we have extrinsic things that we see as changing, that's when we perceive time. We don't have simultaneity, meaning I cannot see even my own body, all the parts of my body at the same time. But I know myself. I don't know my head first, then neck next, then my abdomen, then my legs, right? Not like that, but I know myself as something because we have a unity. Where is this unity coming from? Because we have the non-physical intellect. That's where the unity is coming from. So, so this infinite thing, we're calling this as unity, a single substance. Infinity is actually unity. This is what in Indian philosophy is called Purnamidam Purnamadam Purnat Purnamudachite. That is, there's only one thing. What can you take away from that thing? Because there is nothing else. Take space. There's all, all that there is is space. How can I divide this space? Can I take this space here and put it there? Then I say it becomes different space. No, it's still space, not divisible. We have to revise our idea of division. So then all these things exist in God at the same time. So whatever is going to happen is there. And Morpheus says in, in Matrix, what happened happened and could not have happened any other way. Because it is, there's actually nobody doing anything. But when you are ignorant of secondary causes, go back to the coin toss example. Imagine you are the coin, it's being tossed. You don't know all the causes. It would appear, oh, it could be heads or tails. Choice emerges from randomness. Choice emerges from the ignorance of secondary causes. And going back to Patanjali Yoga Sutras, the other day we were in the Ayurveda Dhamma, and there we saw some of the pictures. Five glaciers. The first glacier is ignorance, and the second glacier is I amness. So, with this ignorance meaning you don't know all the causes. When you don't know all the causes, it appears you have a choice. It appears like you're doing something. You're not doing anything. You're not the doer. You are the knower. You know, you're merely conscious of your actions. You're not deciding anything. Right? This is what the, the Avishishta Advaita says. And then there's a term for this, fate and destiny. The actual term in Indian philosophy is loss of nature for that. Vidhi. Vidhi means loss of nature. Because whatever happens, happens according to the laws of nature. There's nothing beyond the laws of nature. There's no choice that you're making. It's completely according to the laws of nature. Just like how you, how you can predict or how you can know whether a coin is going to fall heads or tails. If you know all the causes, you would know exactly what's going to happen. Now, how to, how to understand this now, look at, look back at your journey here from childhood, from the time you think you were born to here, all that exists at the same time, when you're 10 years old, when you're 15 years old, when you're 20 years old, 25 years old, all those memories exist at the same time. Now there is no choice that you have to specially make. When you were 25 years young and then you, you wanted to do something, oh, I should major in physics because I love physics, so I'm going to choose it. I haven't chosen it. It was done. I became conscious of it. Right? So then comes the idea of freedom versus bond. Are you free? Do you have free will? Are you doing anything actually? 
or are you bound? Right? So before we uh, dwell further, then Vishishta Advaita ends on the concept of ajata. Ajata means no creation. So when we talk about Big Bang and creation, we think, oh, there was nothing. And God sat down, grew up a plan on the first day, you know, had a sumptuous meal on the second day, took his own sweet time, seven days, created the world. There you go, right? But why does God need to do anything? He's all powerful. God doesn't, why does God have to do math or something, write it down or plan? He knows it. He's pure act. His idea is act. There's no time for creation. He's eternal. So ajata means that the universe was never created. It's never going to be destroyed. It is. There's only ease. We perceive it as creation and destruction because we're ignorant of secondary causes. Therefore, we see changes. Therefore, we see time. We see actuality and potentiality. That is in the first section. But in reality, there is only ease, there's only beingness. Ajata, ja is the word that uh, is related to birth. Um, you know, in, uh, we, we have heard this name Janaka, ja means the one who gives birth or something that is born. In fact, the word for people in Sanskrit is praja. That which comes out of something else is, is praja. So ja and, and the uh, prefix a uh, is to negate it, a uh, jata. Nothing was ever born. So then this qualified non duality or Vishishta Advaita asks what is birth? Birth is the false identification of the knower with the body. You're given a name, you're given a form. And you think that's who you are. You are not that. I'm not Rama. This body is given a name. And this body is going to perfectly behave according to the laws of nature. Cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect. That's all there is. I'm speaking. Am I speaking? Or it is being spoken through me? If it is being spoken through me, who is speaking? I'm only aware of action. So, so who is free and who is to be bound? So this is where, again, like just like in duality, we hit a roadblock sort of a thing when it came to infinity, what is infinity? And we ended there and that's where qualified non-duality began. And then we saw that this infinite substance, the single substance has attributes, qualities, sat, chit, and ananda. So sat is ex extension, chit is thought. So sat is your body, chit is your mind, ananda is who you are. You are the knower, you are bliss. You mistake yourself to be this physical thing and you have this notion that I am doing this, I am doing that, but it's completely according to vidhi, loss of nature. Here again, I would like to stress, this is not with that God has a final cause in him and he is has this master plan. Like for example, Spinoza says, oh, uh, people often refer to things like, oh, this person died when a huge rock fell on him. And people say, oh, why did, why was that person there? Then, then they would say, oh, that person was invited to his friend's house. So he was walking and he happened to be there and that rock fell at that moment. Then people say, oh, why did that rock fall at that moment? And they would say, okay, that rock fell at that moment because you know there's a perfect causality for that and it fell. And then uh, there was wind. Uh, why was there wind? Oh, there was some pressure changes in the ocean. And then there is wind. Oh, why were there pressure changes in the ocean? There's a cause for it. There's a cause for everything. There's nothing that is not determined. There's nothing without a cause. If you say there's something without a cause, that must be infinity. It is by itself, of itself, in itself. So to say this will is a concept that we make up, that I have this will and it is free. Who is this I? So Spinoza says that this free will is a conception, is a mental construct. There's no such thing as free will. But it doesn't mean you're free. You have to know who you are first before you ask yourself whether we are free or not. So that's where Advaita comes in. There is a spoon, there is no spoon. 
I am the spoon and I am no spoon. I am everything. I am. That's it. I am. I am the infinity. I am the mover. I am blessed. I am Sat, Shit, Ananda. So we are all modally different. We are different modes of the same thing. We are not substantially different. The essence of all, all human beings is the same. The essence of everything in this universe is the same. We are not essentially different, we are modally different. I can take a water, some water in one bottle, water in a lake, water in ocean. These waters are modally different, but it is water in so far as it is water. It is the same substance. Right? That's right that all these forms and names that you have made up, realize what's the, what's the meaning of these. Language is a mental construction. You actually don't need any language, any words to think about yourself. I need language to communicate with you because I know something and I want to tell you that. So I have to find words that you know and uh, speak in that language in English. If I were to explain the same thing in Canada, right, which you are going to see later and you will realize that you will not understand it. <laughs> but uh, the language comes when I have to communicate with you. But I know who I am. I know what is in me. Why do I need a language to talk to myself? I'm thinking about, okay, this uh, complicated problem of electron in an atom. I want to know the wave function. I don't have to keep telling this to myself. I just sit down. I'm in silence. I don't need to talk to myself in a language because I know who I am. That's what Advaita is saying. Who is the doer? Who, what needs to be done? What, what exactly are you doing? There have been causes all throughout and the next effect is going to be based on the previous cause. I smoke a cigarette. Who's smoking the cigarette? Who's the doer? Who's drinking coffee? Who's the doer? So Advaita says, hold on to that question. Who am I? And the things to consider here is it does not negate reality. It does not deny reality. It is asking you to understand it in its entirety. When, when they say you are not the body, you are not the mind, body doesn't exist, mind doesn't exist, it's all a dream. What we mean is that we are lost in the words. We know, Feynman said, we know the name of a thing and we confuse it to knowing the thing. Knowing the name of a thing is not the same as knowing the, knowing the name of a thing is not the same as knowing the thing itself. And this is what Ramana Maharshi says, be as you are. And Psalm 46 stands is be still and know that I am God. What is the stillness? Be still. Try to observe yourself when you talk. Oh, I did this, I did that. Don't use the word I and try to talk. You will just be silent. It's very hard to talk without using I. So Hold on to this question, who am I? And you will see who you are. And you will realize that, that there is this infinity. And then there is next step. That is, there is nothing to realize. You're already that. Who's to realize? Because you say, oh, I, I haven't realized that deep. I haven't not gone that deep. I haven't had this enlightenment. Who is it that hasn't had this enlightenment? Who? You're already and you think you're not free or you mistake your actions to be your freedom. Your freedom is your responsibility. I can come and say something to you and you can react or you can respond. Freedom is responsibility. And you are the mover and you are responsible for the quality of experience you have here. And that's what Advaita says. And with that, um, uh, before finishing, I would just like to quickly tell you one nice thing that's there in the Advaita philosophy, which you may know by another equation, E is equal to mc squared. We have seen what energy is, we have seen what mass is, C is the speed of light. 
What does this equation actually mean? You see it everywhere, E is equal to mc squared. What does this mean? That you have a physical thing, we say it has inertia, it has mass. That is, if I apply a force, it has some resistance. If I apply it, act on it, it has some resistance to move. I have to apply a certain amount to make the stable move, for example. Right? So that resistance to the action of impetus is what we call as mass. Now, this mass exists as a physical thing, we would say. Now, when this mass becomes energy, where is this energy? This energy is becoming a property of the space. So when a physical thing undergoes substantial change, it becomes Akasha. It becomes the energy of Akasha. So E on the left-hand side is energy of the space. M is the mass of the object. So when we say E is equal to MC squared, when we have a nuclear bomb, when we have a nuclear reactor, if we break two parts, we take a uranium nucleus and break it. There is energy that's coming out. What is that? That energy was before inside this thing, inside this mass, the nucleus. And now you break it, it's becoming a part of space around it. It just doesn't exist by itself. It's a property of the space around it. And the space is not nothingness. It's Akasha. And this is not just some um, lovey dovey philosophy, but it is what physics says, right? And now with our standard model and quantum field theory, this is exactly what we are coming to. When we say, what is an electron? We say electron is an excitation in the quantum field. Where is this field? This field is a property of Akasha, of space. And so that um, is, um, basically the, the entire uh, schools of um, Indian philosophy. And I had one verse that um, I thought I'll end with. So, aham nirvikalpo nirakara rupaha. So this means I am indivisible. Don't read the translation, I just copied it. I couldn't get rid of it. It means I am without, I am thoughtless. I am beyond thought, I am beyond form, I am beyond shape, I am beyond everything because I just am. So that's the realization and that's going back to the first thing that I had shown you. The universe is like water in a mirage and then to whom shall I go down? This God is not somebody, a benevolent king that you must go down to and the benevolent king will give you gifts because you have behaved well. You are God. You are the one, you are the incarnate one. Be the one, be fearless, be strong, have no weakness. And know that if you feel that you have done a mistake, it's not you who has done a mistake, that's providence. You have to do that at that minute, at that second, because it had to be done. Why? There's no final cause. The final cause, the only final cause is because you are God. It is for you, you set up to realize who you are. Because without those mistakes, you would not be who you are. And so this is the path and you are given everything that you require because you are the giver, you are the receiver, you are everything. There is nobody else. You are the Guru. So when they say, listen to the words of Guru, it is not Guru is not somebody outside you. You are the Guru. Your inner self is the Guru. And that's the path to realization. And the path to realization is to realize that you are already realized and you're already here. Because if you were to ask, how do I get to VIIS? You don't have to get anywhere. You're already there, right? So that's the first and only klesha, avidya, ignorance. All that you need to realize is that you are realized already. And that's Advaita and that's the step three. Thank you.